Hey everyone, welcome to Outside Ourselves, a podcast featuring conversations that remind us faith isn't something we do, it's something we receive. Welcome to our first ever episode. I'm so excited today that I'm getting to chat with my friend David Zoll about his newest book, Low Anthropology, The Unlikely Key to a Gracious View of Others and Yourself. Dave is not only an amazing writer and speaker, he is the founder and director of Mockingbird Ministries. He is both theologian and cultural expert who is amazing and super adept at uncovering uh, the surprising ways that grace shows up in our everyday lives. Today we're talking about all things low anthropology, which really just means that we're talking about Christian anthropology. I don't think we mention it because we recorded this episode a few weeks ago, but Dave's book is actually out now. So if you would like to order it, you can do so uh, right now as you listen to the show or afterwards. I definitely think once you hear what he has to say, you're going to want to hear more. So please make sure to check that out. All right, here's the show. Dave, thanks so much for, uh, I want to say being here, but I don't really know where here is. So thanks for, um, thanks for chatting today. Super excited to talk to you about everything that's coming up for you and um, stuff that's going on at Mockingbird. Oh, thanks, Kelsey. This is, yeah, it's fun to be here, whatever. Yeah. A wash in the zeros and ones. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Well, for people who don't know, you have a book coming out um, next week. I don't know when this is going to be released. It might, so I, probably your book will be out by the time we get this out. But um, I'm really excited to talk about it. I read the whole thing and it's awesome. Um, I think it's super accessible for any Christian from any background, but also non-Christians. I think really anyone could pick it up and kind of learn something. So tell us a little mm. bit about about the book and um, why you decided to write it. Sure. Um, uh, well, the book's title is Low Anthropology, uh, The Unlikely Key to a Gracious View of Others, and then in parentheses, and yourself. And so I wrote it for a couple different reasons. Um, and uh, I've just finished actually writing a piece about why I wrote it. So I, I feel like I've got the language here. Um, <laughs> first of all, I wrote it because... I am like a person in the world like anyone else. And the experience of life in 2022 often feels like you're just trudging when you're not sort of with your family and your immediate friends and your contacts. But like the second you sort of look outside, you put your poke your head out of the parapet. It feels like kind of a sea of acrimony and blame mm-hmm. and sort of just bad feeling and uh, or just in a super intense pace of life that we're all trying to barrel down and some uh, trying to make sense of this um th- yeah this kind of uh w- what life has become for many of us which i think yeah. is a huge burden I, th- I don't think life is ever easy but um i was uh, reflecting for several years on what kind of cultural conditions or what what sort of contributes to that feeling that uh i'm the only one who's struggling everyone else seems to have it together uh, I'm the only one who's got problems. I'm the only Christian who's sort of dealing with besetting problems in my own life. And um, I, I, I came to the conclusion that at least in large part, it's a problem of our sort of view of human nature, that we have mm. swallowed a really superficial view of human nature. And that it's a view of human nature that kind of breaks people down into categories of us versus them. Um, It's a view of human nature that is sort of promotes like fantasies about what people are capable of and about what their um, limits are or lack thereof. And it ends up fueling a whole lot of burnout and loneliness and exhaustion, division, all these things. Um, And so I call that a high anthropology, a, a, a view of human nature that's too optimistic and the, mm. the strange thing about an optimistic view of human nature is that instead of it uh, promoting sort of good self-esteem and, and flourishing and all that stuff, what it does is it actually produces shame and hiding and, uh, you know, kind of um, a, a, a real sense of despair. Like, you, yeah, you're, 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 there's that 
Um, you've it's been sold a false bill of goods about what you're yeah. capable of, what other people are capable of, and of course, what God uh, owes you or something like that. So that was one of the, one of the reasons why I wrote the book. And I think that low anthropology, and by that is really just like a, a, a biblically derived or sort of the resources that Christians have to draw on when it comes to telling us who we are, what we're capable of, uh, what it's like to be a sinner, what it's like to be broken, what it's like to be made in the image of God, all of these things. I think we have tremendous resources to draw on. And um, I wanted to make those resources um, accessible in as broad a way as I possibly could. The other reason, Kelsey, and like this is probably the deeper reason, is I work in a church um, and I would say every couple, every, a couple times every month, we have someone who comes into the office who's found their way to church um, they almost are like surprised that they're there. You know, they're like, what am I doing here? Um, because they either are disinterested in Christianity, they find it irrelevant, or they have a sort of an active antipathy towards organized religion, right? Huh. And yet life has brought them to a place where they're interested in God or they're interested yeah. in um, forgiveness or grace or something like that. And they come in and they're sort of, they're usually going through some kind of crisis. Occasionally, it's just like a spiritual awakening. Mm. And, and they meet with one of the clergy and they, um, you can tell, like they want to know more. They're like genuinely like, okay, uh, and... I'm going to give this a shot. Yeah. And then you watch, I watch, and I'm sometimes the person they're visiting with, but most of the time it's someone else. And they, the inclination is not to want to leave them empty hand, like them to leave empty handed. It's like, here's, here's a book for you to read, you know, or here's something that might help you. Of yeah. course, the, Answer is always, oh, I've read the Bible. But I've just found over the years, like I have less and less of these books that are sort of like give to anyone that make sense of the Christian faith to someone who is unfamiliar with it. Most books like that are just loaded with Christianese or in our, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. in our kind of vernacular, Kelsey, it's just nothing but law. Well, so I've been needing a book like this. And so I was like, yeah. uh, you know, screw it. Just I'm going to write it myself or I'm going to yeah. try it's not going to be as good as other people's, but I also found like I've dealt with college students for a lot over the years and they, I, there's certain books that Mockingbird's published or even 1517's published or even these people that I consider to be so playful and interesting. Someone like Robert Capon, like they read it and they don't, yeah. it's, it's too t It's, it's seminary level almost. Yeah. And so I've wanted something to be able to give them that sort of gut level and that they can get something from. And I mean, I want to make faith, I want to make Christ, the Christian faith, if not compelling, well, at least intelligible mm -hmm. to people. So yeah. that's that's what I, why I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah, the great answer. I I mean, I I think it is that for sure. Like, I think that makes total sense thinking about giving it to someone who's just interested in, um, faith. And I think you, you talked about like the idea of low anthropology is a biblically based idea, but it's also rooted in reality. It's rooted in the fact that we live it every day, even if we are kind of unaware of how it's, um, mm -hmm. playing out. So I think that that, that's so helpful for, for people. Um, how do you see, like when people first are introduced with this idea of low anthropology, if you're, you know, talking to someone that's coming into church for the first time, or um, maybe even a Christian, like a lifelong Christian that just has no understanding of, of what that means. What is, what tends to be the reaction? Is there kind of one reaction you've observed that people have, or is it kind of all over the, the board? That's a great question. The, the, what I would say is I noticed that there are diverging reactions depending on the upbringing and the baggage yeah. that someone would have. So what I've found to be true is that people that were brought up in a kind of a very, um, you might even say legalistic or just heavily capital E evangelical type of Christianity, American, an American version, they have often been confronted with an anthropology, an understanding of human nature that they think makes them feel bad about themselves. Mm. And Christianity they see as an engine, if, if they've had a bad experience of it. I see uh, the fallout of sort of 
um, oppressive forms of religion, as a Christian religion, almost always have to do with a very, very heavy use of the law without the gospel. So mm. there's a sense in which they are, you're they are told constantly how much they suck or how, how, how bad they are, how short they fall. And yet there's, um, when they become a Christian, they keep hearing about for non-Christians, it's like, Hey, you have fallen short. You need forgiveness. Here's God's forgiveness. And they watch as people get excited and become Christians. But then mm-hmm. for the Christian, there's this, it's a, what I would call selectively high anthropology. They become a Christian and then they're given this whole new burden of things they need to yeah. do. And so if that's been your experience of Christianity, you'll hear stuff about low anthropology say, Oh, that sounds like shame. That sounds yeah. like self-loathing when in my experience shame and self-loathing are actually the product of a high anthropology what i mean is that you were told that as if you're a christian then you can fulfill the law and yet you can't you don't seem to be able to um and that creates shame Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas before you were non-Christian, you needed God's help. Now it's sort of up to you. And and if you don't say that outwardly, it's sort of what's communicated implicitly. And so there's a selectively high anthropology that comes about the the, the way I talk about it in the book is that it's not defeating to say that you and I are incapable of ever fully getting our act together. What is defeating and shame inducing is the idea that we can, we just haven't been able to pull it off yet. Right. Yeah. So, so there's that group of people that I think are often drawn to the parts of low anthropology that say weakness is more definitive than strength. Uh, yeah. That say it's okay to be vulnerable. This uh, buzzword about vulnerability in our culture is usually a way of people talking about low anthropology without, yeah, while sucking it without out, without naming of, it, or taking any kind of moral valence out of the equation. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But if you're like, I mean, if you're, if you're actually the situation I grew up in, Kelsey was much, was not act was not that I grew up in the East coast, uh, uh, what now known as sort of coastal elitism. And then was just known as like preppy private school life of high, high achieved type a sort of Ivy league people. Yeah. Um, and that's not that's not a comment on my own capabilities. It's just sort of the air I breathed, and that yeah, was sort of yeah. a, like you're special, you're amazing. Anyone who doesn't realize that has got a problem. Um, mm. You're kind of God's gift. It's the word we use today is entitlement. Yeah, and okay. so I've found to people who grew up in that kind of perfectionistic era or atmosphere, when they hear about low anthropology, the notion that we are limited in what we can know, limited in what we can do, that we are all conflicted and not simple minded. We have all sorts of competing motivations that are often opaque to us. And that thirdly, there's an ineluctable dark side of human nature that expresses itself in sort of self-centeredness and kind of the imp of the perverse. Um, They often hear that and be like, oh, someone's finally telling the truth. Like, Hmm. I know this to be true. I'm not the only one. They, you hear a real unburdening. So I yeah. do find that the reaction varies. That makes total sense. I think I, I probably personally tend to feel um, or be in the, the second camp of it. I think for me, like finally understanding or being introduced to law gospel theology, low anthropology, all of these ideas was kind of this unburdening of like, okay, I can't. I don't have it all together and neither does anybody else. And, um, it, it was kind of like a, a huge relief and a comfort. Mm. Um, I think that's a thing, uh, that it can be for a lot of people is a comfort in the sense that they're not alone. Um, you're not alone and yeah. people feel so alone <laughs> and people yeah. feel like, or they think that every people don't struggle the same way they do. And that's just a fiction, it's, but it's like yeah. one of the greatest fictions we all deal with. It's a fiction within the church. It's a fiction outside of the church. It's, and it's, it's really debilitating. You kind of go through these different aspects of low anthropology. And um, I, I'm curious if you've seen people struggle with one of those more than others. I think 
for me, the, the idea of doubleness, mm -hmm. even as a Christian, was really hard to to understand. That's one of the aspects that you talk about. But I don't know. I don't know if there's like a like there's one that you've kind of seen people. Um, no, double doubleness is the hardest. <laughs> yeah, and doubleness yeah. is the one I try to have a new word for. Doubleness is another word for inner conflict or conflictedness. Uh, the Roman seven experience of life of I know the good I should do, but it's the evil I don't want to do that I keep on doing. That a uh, doubleness describes makes sense of why people don't just act the way they say they want to act or aren't. Um, you can't just tell someone what they should do or think and they'll do it. There's an enormous amount of internal resistance or weather. And it doesn't always, it's not always moral. You know, it can just be like, don't press that red button. And all of a sudden I want to press that red button, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but the experience of addiction is usually what reveals our doubleness the most. Um, so mm. doubleness in Christian terms, I'm talking about agency, not about capability. So the problem is not, uh, yeah, is, is that I have competing, I'm sort of an underdog in the, the uh, it, it's like a inside out, the movie Pixar. It's like that yeah, view of yeah. life, which I think is actually true to life and that I'm not, I'm never just one thing and not another. I, um, I can know what the right thing to do is, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to do it. So doubleness is like a very, it's usually a point of pain. Like I can do what I should or what I want to do in most cases, but the places where I find that difficult is usually going to be the part of my life that's painful. Yeah. And I mean, I'm even thinking like shameful, like that's probably where a lot of people's shame comes from. Yes. So double, doubleness is, 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 is very difficult. And it runs deeply against the grain of a kind of a modern understanding of the human beings as being sort of captains of their own ships. And yeah. I just need to tell you what to do and you'll do it. Um, that is a very a kind of a, a modern American or just Western idea that's simply not true and never has been true. And Augustine knew that and Paul knew that and Jesus knew that. And if you want to love people, um, if you have any desire to pastor them or care for them, that is a, or yourself, you have to understand this truth that we are like a jumble of competing mm. forces and it's not that clear cut. And also, by the way, under the head heading of, uh, cause doubleness is usually about motivation, um, that people are emotional creatures that we're not um, yeah. intellectual creatures. We, 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 yeah. we have intellectual capacity. I think one of the phrases that I use in there is that reason is uh, confirmatory, not exploratory. So we, we use our intelligence to sort of justify what we already think or what our intuition tells us. And that's, a, that's what social scientists have been saying this forever. I think the Bible said it better. Paul did. He was... Um, uh, but I haven't found enough Christians sort of connecting those dots. And so I was like, oh, I guess I should yeah. do this. The bondage of the yeah. will is how Luther talks about it. It's, it doesn't mean we don't have a will. <laughs> I can choose right. between, you know, black socks and green socks, but I can't choose to feel a certain way about my socks. I can't choose to love a person I don't love. You know, I, yeah. I can choose to not be mean to, I can, I can act in a search a way that's not mean to them, but I cannot force myself to, uh, feel something. We tend to assume we personally operate intellectually, like we're <laughs> above emotions and yet everyone else around us is making these quick, rash, emotional judgments. And we can't, we don't understand why like i feel like there's some some conflict there where we i don't know like i i when i thinking if i get upset about something with politics or mm -hmm. what's going on it's 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 always like well i know i know better why do they not know better and i cannot it's not until i realize i'm we're both parties myself yeah. and the other people involved are just making an emotional decision 
where they have emotional reasons. And maybe some of them are more valid. I don't know, but you're totally yeah. right about yeah. that. It's, it's, and, and there are, again, there are certain places where we're not conflicted, where we feel, but, but like the stuff of where our life plays out is usually the place where we're like, I know I should love this person. I know I should forgive my parents. You know, what is it always? It's like, I just can't forgive myself. Like you cannot force yourself to do that. You know, it's, it's, yeah. these are, these are unmanageable. This is the unmanageable part of reality. So yeah, yeah, doubleness is not flattering. And we always think that if other people were just more like us and could see it the way, way we do, then we'd be great. But, you know, you just have to talk to the person you live with and they'll, they'll, they'll find, they'll know, they'll know the place <laughs> like, well, okay, you might, yeah. this might not get under your skin. This, the way that such and such happens, but like, Let's see how you act when you're, you know, with your parents who you haven't seen for yeah. however long, you know? Can you kind of talk to us about, um, I think you, you say pretty bluntly, forgiveness is the solution. It's, it solves the problem hmm. of um, you're laying out like sin, but then also the way we tend to minimize it or we tend to avoid it. Can you talk to us a little bit about how forgiveness is that solution? Yeah, the book is constructed so that it gets progressively like more intense, as I said. And like, usually the way doubleness is addressed in people's lives is like a new desire supplants an old one, right? Like it's, uh, you know, you, uh, you stop playing that video game because a new one comes out that you like more, you know, or you fall mm. in love and you want to be with this person more than you care about the video game. Um, <laughs> Self-centeredness, the way that that is the only real way to deal with the fallout of sin, and which is, I just, is sort of a euphemism, self-centeredness is my euphemism for sin, um, is through reconciliation and forgiveness. So um, yeah, I, I think that one of the ways we deal with sort of misbehavior today is we try to get behind it and minimize it by, by figuring out what people's motives were. And uh, well, if you knew what their childhood was like, well, then you would have empathy and then you would realize they, they couldn't help it. And therefore they don't really need forgiveness. They just need patience, you know, um, or we deny it and we sort of act like, um, you know, what I did wasn't that bad, but yeah. I think what Christianity, the, the Jesus does in his parables and, um, is sort of, you say, actually, no, there, there is such a thing as malicious intent. And if we're honest with ourselves, we are more out, we are, we, we, our motives are more mixed and we did do something with intent more than more often than we can imagine. And the, what we need is not for the king to shrink our debt we need yeah. the king to absorb our debt and that's yeah. why he talks i think in in those I, the parables of the unjust steward is the one i use in the book or I, I look at in the book but i i think there's something fundamental about payment that you know kelsey i was i was talking about this i was we were on the mocking cast the podcast i do we were talking mm -hmm. about south africa in the years since 1994, since apartheid was uh, dis destroyed or dismantled. And what this writer, Eve Fairbanks, notes is that these um, white uh, South Africans, Afrikaners, especially those who were worked hardest to dismantle apartheid, are, are deeply sad, like they're having a hard time in life. Even though their lives are going well, like the, economically they're fine, she picked up on this deep sort of ennui or sadness. And she quotes this guy who's been like, who, who this widespread feeling that they got off too easy, like that white people basically got off too easy for apartheid. And that they're almost like the black South Africans are like shoving their face in it by not forcing them to pay more. And they're like, they want to pay more. They're like, M give me something more to do. I need to, um, uh, he, I think the the line says the Bible is right about one thing. It is much it's infinitely more difficult to receive than to give, especially if the gift is is mercy. And you have these people dying to be able to atone, um, because they're well aware that they're that even if there were reasons galore for why apartheid came into being, ultimately it's seen as evil, you know and. 
what do you do with evil and that kind of will to power, that domination? Like, well, forgiveness is the only real thing that can be done. That's super interesting because it is, it's like, it seems to me like people, and I, I don't know if this is just true of our day and age or across time, but people can come to this understanding that what they did was wrong, whether it's one act or, you know, that they are limited, that they, they, uh, there are bad parts of them. But yeah, the, this, then this idea that they are not the solution or the reality that they are not the solution to that, Mm -hmm. um, that there's nothing they can do to get out of it is I think what trips a lot of people up. It trips me up. Like I, cause I always, you know, I have a bad, even this last week we had some childcare issues and then our power went out and immediately I'm like, okay, what do I need to do to, I need to get my ducks in a row and I need to make this better. Mm-hmm. Um, which there's some practicality to that, but like, it's me figuring out how to get myself out of the mess. I think we just operate that way naturally. You no, know, it's much more comfortable if I can be the one to arrange it or to like contribute. Cause then it can be like, I feel I've contributed enough. Like we don't want to be told. It's just unfair to be told that like you, 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 this has been settled on your behalf and there's nothing really you can do about it. Like you're like, I want to suffer. I want, I feel like there's some injustice that needs to be covered here. Maybe not with childcare, but I know exactly, (laughs) I know what you're talking about though. It's a very common refrain today. It it, like I so-and-so forgave me, but I can't forgive myself that not only highlights the sort of doubleness aspect of like, I I know I should, or I know they've told me to forgive me, but I also know that like uh, the emotional reality is that um, forgiveness sometimes feels impossible to, and you can certainly not generate it on your own steam. Yeah. We much more prefer payment and forgiveness are different things. Like it's just, it's not like. Yeah. That's, I think that is such a crucial distinction that we don't, we miss so much. We think we, we operate as if they're completely the same thing. Yeah. It's really, Um, it's really hard to find like allegories or um, even, you know, metaphors that can do this justice because forgiveness is such a miracle. And, And again, the, the miracle, one of the things I try to convey in this book, Kelsey, is that it's like, What's so great, it, it, the great miracle is that given what our state, the fact that so many beautiful and, you know, wonderful things happen is really a shock and it's wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's awe inducing. It's, it's not, it's the combination between expecting the best versus expecting the worst. And I, I'm not, it's, I'm not trying to like validate pessimism, but I do yeah. think that in fact, a more optimistic view of the world and human nature sets people up for bitterness because life just turns out to be life. And um, But if you have a low anthropology really does uh, open a person up not only to needing help from the outside and the, d- needing to be loved, but you also get to say, oh my goodness, like the fact that so many wonderful things happen at all is such a miracle. And it's such, so, yeah. such, so, such evidence that we're not living in a meaningless world or we get what we deserve kind of breaking bad kind of world. Yeah. Yeah. That's the surprise, uh, in, in our world. It's not, it's not sin and resistance. It's these acts of grace when we see them wherever we see them. Yeah. Yeah. And we do see them. Yeah. All the time. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. I feel like we've kind of, like danced around this, but you, I mean, you're basically what you're getting people to is if you have this view of low anthropology, you're able to, um, be more gracious to yourself or, or know that grace is given to you. Mm. And, um, then also offer grace to those around you, knowing they are dealing with these same things that you are. Is there, is there a difference between um, making excuses for people (laughs) and that um, and, and those, those limits or that, that sin and dealing with them graciously? Like, is there a line 
uh, how do we kind of know <laughs> the difference or is there a difference? Maybe it's, maybe there's not that big of a difference. No, I, I, I don't know. I, I think there's like a way to just, um, sometimes people will hear this book and they'll think like, well, nobody's perfect. So whatever, you know, why, yeah. why bother? Or like, it's okay. You know, you can't, you can't really be certain about anything. So why even try to be certain about any, about, you know, um, yeah. like I say, it's, it's it, low anthropology isn't there to dissolve injustices or real convictions. It's more just like a default humility when it comes to dealing with people yeah. in those situations. So I don't really know the answer to how, well, l- let me say this. I, I don't, the, although the book has a sort of a slightly self-helpy subtitle, which is just sort of, you know, unavoidable if you actually want to sell a book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the real gift of a low anthropology is not just recalibrating expectations of other people or yourself. Those hmm. things are great. And that, that can be helpful for a season. Um, or patience with people who are doubled in all sorts of ways and, and you know, tied in knots. That can be good too, but the real gift of a low anthropology is not some sort of new perspective or adjusted um, lens or even knowledge. The real gift of a low anthropology is it allows, um, it's a view of human beings that uh, um, looks to God. God is the hope, not my better uh, perspective or my new yeah. mindset. And so without a low, a, a high anthropology basically says, God, I might need occasional uh, hand from, uh, you know, a helping hand, or maybe God needs me to partner meaningfully with God in the world or something like that. But low anthropology says, actually, I need, I need God to, to live, you know, to, mm. and not die. I need God for deliverance, for salvation, to save me from death. Um, and so I don't want to make, while there is all sorts of fruit of low anthropology, and I try to make that clear because people are so allergetic to the idea that human beings are less than or not as mm, noble yeah. as uh, we, we, we're, <laughs> we're the sum of both our best and our worst. And we happen to, we like to think of human beings are just sort of their best moments. Um, I don't want to suggest that all, while there are plenty of fruit, curiosity I talk about, if you can never, if, if by definition you can never know everything, well, then you can remain curious about things and be interested in what your spouse has to say, even if you think you know what they're going to say. Hmm. Um, you can, you pursue friendships because you know you cannot, there's no such thing as a lone wolf in life. You know, no one can make it on their own. So th- there are all these fruit. But the real fruit is faith because yeah. uh, the person who is incomplete in of themselves and cannot save themselves needs a savior. So yeah. that's the, the book is a quote unquote pre-evangelistic in that respect. And it, but I think yeah. again, like it's not hidden. Like I say, I'm a Christian and like I find that people don't understand Christianity if they don't understand human beings are in need of more than just help, but like salvation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that I um I read this uh I think it was on his newsletter, this piece from David French hmm. this weekend about he wrote about um he was writing about the difference between Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones cuz you know those are mm-hmm. those have both come out and he's talking about what in particular Tolkien and Lord of the Rings gives us that is kind of missing from today's world. And it's this hope that you're, you're talking about. It's the, to me, it's the solution um, that again, we've been talking about all day. um, The solution to our low anthropology, because I think like Game of Thrones is an amazing show and does a really amazing thing in maybe revealing Hmm. that low anthropology or revealing that everyone has these dark, parts of them, but it doesn't really offer much of a solution. Oh, hundred um, percent. And I, I couldn't agree more. Like I, I love that piece. I know what you're talking about. And I think that yeah. Tolkien is, I take him 
nine days out of the week over over George R. R. Martin. And I still like yeah. this. I like the intrigue and I like this yeah. stuff. But there's nothing – it's unremitting uh, in sort of it's like this is all there is. Um, and in Tolkien, there is such a thing as good, and it does have a f- force of its own. I mean, there – there, you know, I don't want to get into the, the theology of these things, but I do, I do find it to be refreshing because it holds out hope of deliverance and uh, kind of, you know, there being a will behind the universe that you see kind of through the gods and stuff like that, that you just don't have in, it's, uh, it's much more Machiavellian in. Uh, yeah. It's just a, I, I'm, I, what's funny is they're uh, at the end of, Game of Thrones, the original series, they had like a, they came out with a song and a music video that we watched for some reason on, I can't remember who's in it, but um, the song is called Power is Power. <laughs> and it's kind of true. Like, it's just that, that is Game of Thrones. It's like, it's this power is power circular wheel that they're going around and there's just no, no escape from it. And, um, and that's, I think, back to that French David French piece, that's kind of exactly what he's talking about is power is not the only thing that we should be striving for. Um, and Tolkien does such a good job of showing us that. So, but it requires, um, I, Kelsey, don't you think it requires an enormous amount of energy to constantly keep up this idea? One of the things that Game of Thrones does do is in revealing and saying, okay, uh, you know, the, the people that are supposedly the unassailable good and the unassailable bad actually have a lot more in common than we think. Like, um, what what Tolk what what Martin does is he basically says even though those who you think are good have bad tendencies, you know, and are mm-hmm. valuable. What Tolkien yeah. would do is would say, or I think I think a more Christian view would be to say, even those who are totally broken and totally reprehensible are capable of works of great beauty. Um, yeah. And that's what yeah. our, our, like, a, you know, we, we talk about it in terms of like today, the debates around cancel culture or art that is deemed as the, as an artist makes a mistake, like does something terrible, maybe, or is ter- comes out as a, some sort of terrible racist or hate monger. Yeah. And yeah. You have to say, yeah. well, well, therefore, none of their, their work is, 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 it's all tainted by this evil. And what you might even yeah. say, well, perhaps, but you could also say that, like, isn't it beautiful that, that the best part of them or like that they're that even terrible people are capable of acts of great beauty. Like that's a, yeah. that's the flip side of saying that good people are capable of acts of terrible self-interest. So I, yeah. I think there's like a, I think there's a relief to dropping the pretense that, um, that I have it more together than I think, or that I'm more, um, capable or less self-centered than I am. There's a real relief to that, and it takes a lot of energy to prop that up, especially because it it, yeah. it allows us to um, that 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 belief allows us to vilify other people so so yeah terribly. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, and it's just a constant. It's the energy comes from constantly weighing and measuring and counting where you are on the scale of, of good and bad, because you're hoping you know the scales tip in the favor of good for yourself. And yeah, I think that that's, that's a really good point of, uh, it just doesn't work that way. I don't, God doesn't work in, um, as you know, you talked about the parable of the unjust servant. He doesn't work in bookkeeping. So it's, that's not even a a frame in which of course that's how the world is playing out, but that's not how he's, he's looking at things. There's, I think a trend lately I don't know if it's just lately, but um, kind of this language of like celebration of life and um, always, always propping up those who have have died as only good. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's there's some there's something that's good and hopeful to that, probably within grief of remembering how people are good, remembering their best parts. But is that. I don't know. I'm curious if if you think what you think about maybe even just specifically like the language of funerals and remembrances after people have gone. Is it helpful um, to view people in light of their best motives 
or is there another way to do it? I don't know. I, I, f- I feel like there was something in the, at the end of the book where you're talking about funerals and death. Yeah, I, there is. There's a, there's a, there, I quote an obituary by, by, a, by a Lutheran guy, actually, who wrote his own obituary. Okay. And oh, that's right. okay. um, he sort of trots out. It's very self-deprecating. It's unbelievably self-deprecating. Yeah. And he talks about his, his accomplishments. But what you what comes across is the gratitude. And he didn't take himself that seriously. And he was grateful to God and to his church for sort of helping him. And he's able, therefore, there's a freedom to him that he's allowed to sort of make jokes about how he, um, you know, always chose the money over over integrity, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. But then he credits God with, you know, keeping him sober from gambling. And it's a very, very powerful instance of, I think, if you go to a funeral, the the outward public figure that people sort of need to remember is usually they, they talk about their best moments and their positive attributes and their greatest accomplishments. And those there's truth to that. But if you go to the people that really love those, that knew them and loved them, they'll tell stories that'll make you laugh about that person. Do you yeah, remember yeah. when so-and-so got pulled over and talked his way out of that thing and we all knew he was drunk or so, whatever it is, <laughs> there'll be some yeah. sort of falling on the face or some kind of chink in the armor that solidified those bonds and that, they're, yeah. that, they, that for them in that moment is not evidence of their shortcomings, but evidence of their humanity and like they're, they're, they, they start crying Sure, they might start crying thinking about the sort of selfless acts that this person did. But when you're yeah. dealing with a deep loss, you're dealing with the loss of someone who is real, um, who you knew at their best and their worst. And most of yeah. the sort of deeply loving tributes you find are not hagiography. They're not worship of the person. Hmm. They are, I miss this person because this person, we knew each other. And we yeah. were in it together and somehow we survived. And without them putting up with me when I was such and such, I would never have gotten through. Like, and so it's bathed. Real love is just bathed in like the chinks in the armor, the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities. And yes, even sin. It doesn't yeah. excuse the sin, but it means redemption occurs at the point of failure, not yeah. Mutual admiration yeah. society. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's, thank you. That's a, that, um, is a super helpful clarification, I think. Um, is there anything like as you were writing this that kind of surprised you? Um, it's, I find that it's very, it's very hard to talk to people about the human condition in a way that's honest and truthful, that, that doesn't sort of push the wrong buttons. And by that, I mean, doesn't shut people down. Uh, and tr- tr- I, the word today is trigger their, their shame or their, um, the no that they heard from a parent or from a pastor or something like that. And so I sometimes feel like it's a dance you do um, to find just the right examples, um, just the right words. Um, but I've also, it's surprising, I also find that very few people, when you get down to it, are resistant to hmm. um, to low anthropology because it's true. Like, it's just true. And it's, and it's it's always a relief, always a relief to deal with what's true. And I think truth is where God resides. So it's not like a, yeah. we're not left there to our own devices a la Jon Snow, you know. The other thing I would say is like I had to deal with it in terms of my own life. And so I have a section in there on depression. And that was some fresh thoughts for me because I've always felt like um, to be depressed is evidence of low anthropology, meaning people are saddled with conditions that they don't choose and sort of affect them in all sorts of ways. But... um, but and you know uh, what I realized was when, for me the the actual experience of depression is is a high anthropology thing because I I get into the state where I I feel hopeless about the future and uh, there's a complete dark the horizon is completely dark I don't see, like for me the experience of depression is like I'm trapped there's no way out 
everything is downhill from here. I cannot see a future. I cannot see a future. And I find that's true with a lot of people who get really depressed. And there's physiological things going on. But what is happening in that moment is an ironclad certainty that the way things are right now is how they're always going to be. And that is a high anthropology kind of way of viewing the world. A low anthropology says, this is how things are. I can honestly say this is how things are. And yet I cannot know what the future may hold. It may get worse. But if past experience is any indication, it could also get better. I don't know. That's low anthropology. And that's a hopeful word for me. And I didn't really realize that. That was, that was something I had to think through because um, I didn't want the book to be a abstract sort of trip through other people's lives. Yeah, no, I thought that 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 point in particular was super insightful to me that there's this tie between um certainty and depression and this and high anthropology uh I had never thought about before. So, yeah, I thought I thought that was great. I feel like it'll be helpful for a lot of people. Is there anything else that you kind of wish or want people to know about the book before before they read it or um, look into it more, anything that you hope that they would gain from it? Well, sure. It's, I don't, if someone picks it up thinking that it's uh, me and, or engaging in sort of intra-Christian debates about human nature, Calvinists think this, Roman Catholics think this, hmm. and Presbyterians, you know, or Lutherans think this, and Anglicans think this, like, that's not... The book is there's a one sec there's a section in there about semi Pelagianism and selectively high anthropology when it comes to low anthropology and religion, which I think is really important and it's true and it could be received as a broadside against a certain type of uh, legalism in Christianity. But the if if you're looking for that, it's not going to be the book is trying to get again four or five steps back from that and. Yeah. Uh, it's not doing that necessarily because I want to um, uh, sell more copies. So that would be nice. It's doing it because I think the world needs this and I need it. Mm. And I, I think that we've made it unintelligible to people by clothing everything in Christian terms. So Malcolm Muggeridge was a sort of a crotchety English Christian guy, like around sort of a little post C.S. Lewis, but a um, bit of a pundit for a while in England. And he would do something where he'd write a whole column and then just have one sentence at the end that would sort of point towards the gospel or towards Jesus. Hmm. And I think that's more uh, compelling. And I think that's more effective yeah. than if people are looking for me to like dot my I's and cross my T's and be extremely precise. And I'm not trying to communicate with I'm trying to communicate what I think is the great heritage of my faith and what I draw yeah. upon to people that haven't can't sort of get past the door in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so that's yeah. the I guess the caution, maybe it's an insecurity. Yeah. But it's it's, it's I, hard. well, I think you're yeah, I think you're drawing a larger circle um which is needed especially in a world where Christians are not well, and specifically in America, you know, there's Christianity is not um, dominant anymore. People lack belief, so I think that there's there is a true beauty to that, and kind of uh, gives people an open door to learn more. Basically, what we're saying is, if you don't know what semi Pelagianism means. <laughs> You can still read this book. You can read yes. it. Yes. I don't, I'm not interested in just like talking to my same – I love my friends and I, I'm glad we have we agree on certain things. But the world is out there hurting and in huge amounts of despair. And, and let's uh, draw the circle wider because we've got something really wonderful to – good news to share that involves acknowledgement of the bad news. So also want it to make be something that gets Christians excited about this amazing yeah. – uh, resource and uh, tradition that they have to draw on. That's not that, that like yeah. secular people these days are better at using than Christians are. Like, so it's. Yeah. 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 That's so true. Yeah. Hopefully a good conversation starter 
for people, Christians to start thinking about how, how to dialogue with people about the human condition in a way that's gracious and like you said, kind of is able to avoid those trigger points as much as possible. Um, is there, I, I know you're going to be kind of on the road mm. in the next month or so. <laughs> what should we be looking out for from, from you and from Mockingbird in particular this fall? What do you guys have going on? I'll be at the 1517 conference in San Diego. Great. I can't wait. Awesome. Uh, I'll be on the road. There's a tour. If you go to Mockingbird, ember.com backslash low anthropology, you'll find about 100 dates, not 100, but like 30 dates. So I'll be in the Midwest, <laughs> some in Minneapolis. I'll be in uh, New York. I'll be in Washington. I'll be in Tennessee and I'll be in Texas. And, and I, 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 I love travel. It's not always easy with little kids, but I do love it. Yeah. Um, Mockingbird, I have got to, uh, we'll continue with our podcast, the mocking cast and continue to publish, uh, books and, and do all the various things that I think we've, we've got a new issue of the magazine coming out called the sleep issue about sleep, which I think is a really, uh, fascinating subject. Yeah. Um, I'll be doing a gazillion podcasts for this though. And my life yeah. is sort of low anthropology, um, morning, noon, and night for the next little bit. Oh, we have a we have a so we we have a conference this fall in Tyler, Texas. Um, okay, and then it's a few weeks after the fifteen seventeen, and then in That's January right, yeah. we've got one in Florida in oh, cool. Winter Park, which we thought was a good thing to do, and then in April. Where we'll be where you've spoken before. Kelsey will be back in New York the end of April, 27th to the 29th. Okay. Mockingbird NYC. Be there or be square. Yes. It's so great. Hope everyone can can go to Mo the Mockingbird Conference in the spring and here we still stand in the fall. It's the best way to do it. It is. So, Outside Ourselves is a 1517 podcast. To learn more and view all of our other podcasts, please go to 1517.org forward slash podcasts. Also, did you know that our annual conference is called Here We Still Stand is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, we've sold out of tickets. It's completely booked. But if you would still like to hear the speakers and be a part of the conference, you can do that because we have a free live stream available. If you want more information on the conference in general, the topics covered, the speakers, and where you can find that live stream, please go to our website, 1517.org. You're going to be able to find all of that information on our homepage. Thanks so much.